Eggstart Pits, Brighton and Hove Albion away. Kickoff is a supporter unfriendly 5:30 p.m. with rail strikes meaning that the last train back to London is leaving at 9:40 p.m. So really make sure you check before you leave lest you get stuck down there on bank holiday weekend with hotel rooms at a bit of a premium. I know I looked. So Brighton then. For what it's worth, they're top of the league at the moment. Their six points have come from a brace of 4-1 wins, though it's fair to say they could have started with an infinitely worse fixture list than one that saw them open at home to Luton and away to Wolves. Still, as they say, you can only beat what's in front of you. Now, back in the more depressing moments of last season, I recall that amongst the discussions over a possible replacement manager, the name of Graham Potter came up. This was all before his ill-fated spell at Chelsea. Now, our board's usual mouthpieces floated it out there that Potter wasn't up to much, really, and that his success at Brighton was only down to their successful transfer policy, which was based on a rigorous application of scientific analysis of each player under consideration. You know, as if having a proper and successful transfer policy was somehow not desirable. Which is why, probably, we've signed something like 50 strikers under the current ownership without much in the way of success. Much has been made of the profit-taking that Brighton have indulged in this season so far, with big-money deals involving the sale of McAllister to the Scousers and Caicedo to Chelsea, neither of whom had the best weekends last week. They haven't exactly been accruing a lot of interest from the proceeds, though with no fewer than five new first-team arrivals for Daisy to get her teeth into. The first arrival was Watford striker Hal Pedro. The 21-year-old Brazilian's undisclosed fee was said to be a Brighton club record £30 million. He was on target in the opening weekend when against Luton, but had dropped to the bench for last week's visit to Molyneux. Boss de Zerbi claiming that Pedro needed to be more ruthless in front of goal and to work harder out of possession. All that after one game. The Syrian-born German midfielder, the pleasantly rhyming Mahmoud Dahoud, came in on a free from Borussia Dortmund. He and his parents left Syria before his first birthday, and the player came up through the German youth system, gaining the first of his two full caps to date in 2020. He's played in both of their matches so far this season. There was another freebie in the form of James Milner, who, like many before him, has elected to spend his twilight years down on the south coast. I guess I'm not the only one who feels old at the memory of him making his debut for Leeds back at the age of 16, which is 20 years ago for pity's sake. I asked Daisy what she was doing 20 years ago, but she merely mumbled something about primary school, bless her. Goalkeeping resources were boosted by the arrival of Netherlands under-21 keeper Bart Verbruggen, he said carefully. The fee commanded for the custodian, who has four Dutch caps at under-21 level, was £16.3 million. He's been made second choice behind Jason Steele at the moment. Jason Steele's name sounds like one of those 1970s Playboy detective shows. Verbruggen can look out for a run-out in the League Cup, if not the Thursday night conference. Brazilian defender Igor Julio came in from Fiorentina for a fee of £15 million. Igor, as he is generally known, will be familiar face to many, as we last faced him only three games ago, out in Prague, where he came on as a sub just in time to see the back of Bowen as he slotted home the winner. You have to feel a bit sorry for Igor. Anyone born in a place called Born Successo has quite a lot to live up to, and his honours list, which comprises of one Coppa Italia runners-up medal and one Thursday night conference runners-up medal, is more reminiscent of Born Spursio than Born Successo. And now I hereby make an announcement. I hereby declare that the great name of the season competition is well and truly open. Strictly speaking, this signing isn't a first teener, but come on, a player called Noel Atom is not one to be missed. He'll probably end up back in the 1970s in a series with Jason Steele. Let's move on, shall we, to the wild and wacky world of association football. And the distaff side found Spain one match too many in last weekend's World Cup final. In this, we saw another example of the VAR decision being explained to spectators, which worked well, albeit with the ref very much milking her moment in the spotlight. During the presentations, Spanish FA boss Ribiales took time out from grabbing his crotch in front of the Spanish royal family to plant a smacker on the lips of Jenny Hermoso. 
Now, he's still in charge of the Spanish FA at the time of writing, but FIFA is sharpening their knives as we speak. The internal backstabbing within FIFA is not going to miss an opportunity to get rid of a potential enemy this good. Elsewhere, in a revelation that's about as surprising as seeing a Liverpool player dive, the obnoxious Mike Dean has admitted that during his spell in Stockley Park, he used to ignore blatant on-field errors to protect his mates on the pitch. Anthony Taylor, in particular, being the beneficiary of Dean's dishonesty. Dean, of course, is now cashing in on his years of self-promotion at the expense of the paying customer by taking the sky's shilling, thereby prolonging his years of self-promotion at the expense of the paying customer. It would be nice to think that PGMOL might want to take some form of action against Dean for obtaining money by deception or something, but since he'd need to have another 2,000-odd offences taken into account, it's not likely it'd happen. Still, it's nice to have our suspicions confirmed after all these years. And so on to us. It was an odd game last week. Having, ta- having taken the lead, and yes, it's nice, isn't it, to have someone who can take a decent corner, by the way. We went all last 20 minutes against Bournemouth and sat back far too deep. Now, defending and countering on the break is all well and good, but it does rather depend when you're doing both parts of that equation well. Now, in the first half, we didn't, and the way we lined up invited players to run at us and take on defenders. So they did. The equaliser had been coming, and it was precisely this formation that led to the penalty being given away. Good job Ariola chose Sunday to make his first Premier League penalty save from what admittedly wasn't a good spot kick. Clearly, at half-time, Chelsea was strolling off, thinking that all that was required of them to win was to, well, just turn up for the second half. Thankfully, the message on how to defend got through to the players, and helped by a Chelsea side who displayed a lot more naivety than one might expect for a billion quid, they were playing right into our hands. We kept things narrow, meaning the ball spent an awful lot of that 76% of the time it was in their possession, going backwards and forwards across the goal like one of those bar football games. The second part of that game involves making the most of the ball when you have it. Ward Prowse's pass to Antonio was sublime for two reasons. Firstly, well, it was just a great pass anyway. However, crucially, the pass found Antonio with half a yard of space to turn and run at his defender, rather than, as is all too often the case, with his back to goal and the defender close enough to swap DNA. There was still a lot to do, of course, and be honest... When he got into that shooting position, how many of you were genuinely convinced he was actually going to score? I'm not sure I was, but it was a blinding finish. Aguard's daft but correct sending off scarcely made a difference, Chelsea giving a masterclass in how not to play against opponents down to ten men. On the refereeing, I couldn't help but notice that the instruction on issuing yellow cards for kicking the ball away seems to have lasted all of one week. Then given the fuss and bother all about a paqueta last week, which kind of broke too late in the week for me to really comment on, I guess it was inevitable that he would actually get on the score sheet. The penalty, and again it came down to naive defending, was well dispatched, even if we have to get used to that damned stuttering run-up if he has to take more of it. On the betting stuff, it boils down to this really. If he's guilty, ban him. If not, well, don't. We'll find out in the fullness of time. I would say that his caution against Chelsea was a bit stupid, but only because it resulted from the incompetence of Ref Brooks, who failed to punish any of the three fouls committed on him before shooting the messenger. Squad news, and we have one, maybe two additions to the squad by the time you read this. Konstantinos Mavropanos is a done deal, coming in for €25 million, some of which went to Arsenal, who had a sell-on clause in the deal which rescued him from his having to do charity work in Islington sending him over to Stuttgart. Although he's primarily a central defender, he can also play at right-back. His arrival in the squad is well-timed, given that Aguerd is the only absentee this weekend, serving his one-match suspension for his two yellows on Sunday. As for Mavropanos, I think I'll refer to him as Con, my early suggestion of Stavros being vetoed by Daisy on the ground of taste or something. The other arrival is likely to be Mohamed Kudas, at the time of writing, a fee has been agreed with Ajax, or if you prefer Ajax, but the deal is not quite over the line, as pundits say. More about him, we hope, in the next preview. So, on to the prediction then. They've been a bogey side in recent years, and last season's trip down there was one of the most spineless displays I can remember. However, ever the optimist, well, sometimes, I have a sneaking suspicion that this trip may be different. 
Ward Prowse impressed on debut, as did Alvarez, and I'd like to think that we'll be a little more vertebrate this time around. So I'm going to place the £2.50 that I was going to spend on a stick of rock for Daisy on a draw. So Mr Winston, if you please, could I suggest a wager on a 2-2 draw? Enjoy the game.